good morning everyone uh, welcome to tai sustainability summit the largest summit hosted by tai hyderabad uh, we have over 40000 registrations and growing this is surain tai hyderabad charter member and co-founder login soft india i am excited to introduce the topic for this session ai driving higher crop yields in agritech we have put together an amazing spread of wonderful speakers from various expertise and this session is moderated by Shrini Chandupatla. Shrini Chandupatla is a senior entrepreneur, a startup evangelist, and an angel investor. Shrini is a past board member of Thai Hyderabad and a chair for startup committee for Thai Sustainability Summit. Shrini is a mentor and an advisor for several startups as well. Previously, Shrini worked with corporates such as IBM, Sybase, New York Stock Exchange, and Goldman Sachs in the USA. Currently, Shrini is co-founder of Manjira Digital Systems. Manjira Digital Systems is in the business of developing AI interface, interface accelerators. Shrini, uh, glad to have you here. Please take over from here, introduce your panel, and I'm looking forward to an exciting and insightful section, session. Thank you all, enjoy the discussion, thank you. Thanks a lot, Surain. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome, and thanks for joining this session. Our topic today is AI driving higher crop yields. Dear audience, as per United Nations report, do you know that food production must double by year 2050 to meet the demand of the world's growing population? Our population is going to increase by 2 billion people and reach almost 10 billion by year 2050. That said, our food production needs to be double, if not more, to meet the demand. Let's explore to see if technology can play a major role and make a significant impact in increasing food production. I'm excited to share that we have a great set of panelists with diversified backgrounds to share some valuable insights on this topic. During our conversation, we will cover technology trends, challenges, investment landscape, and more importantly, identify the key opportunities in agri-tech domain. I'm going to now introduce our distinguished speakers on our panel. No particular order. I'll just go one by one. I have uh, Rema Subramanian. Rema is the co-founder managing partner at Ankur Capital. She has a vision to use her multi-decade CXO and entrepreneurial experience to bring the tools to young startups to become game changers. She has worked across education and information technology sectors, taking young companies from scratch to mid-sized ventures. Rema is a cost accountant from ICFI, and when she has more spare time, she likes to travel and try her hand at growing plants. Welcome, Rema. We have Krishna Kumar, founder and CEO of Cropin. Cropin is a leading AI and data-led ag tech organization that provides software as a solution uh, tools to agribusinesses. Krishna is 40 under 40 achiever by Business World 2018 and top 10, 25 tech entrepreneurs of 2019 by Entrepreneur India magazine. Welcome, Krishna. And we have uh, Dodla Sunil Reddy, the managing director of Dodla Dairy. Sunil Reddy is the managing director and started his entrepreneurial journey at a young age of uh, 24 with a passion for agriculture. He has more than 25 years of experience in the dairy industry, has an amazing growth story and went uh, public this year. I'm referring to Dodla Dairy. Sunil is also associated with a large scale hydroponic fruit and vegetable product. Welcome Sunil, uh, nice to have you all. Okay, um, just to set the context, um, I wanted to go over some of the technology trends uh, and, and uh, some valuable insights that every one of the speakers can share with us. Uh, so let me go around the table and uh, get uh, high level thoughts and perspectives on our topic at hand. 
please take a couple of minutes to share your views. Uh, we can start with uh, Krishna and then go to Rema and then Sunil. Krishna, go ahead, please. Thanks, thanks, Rani. Yeah, so, you know, Crockett is a, uh, you know, deep tech company and we're trying to solve some of the complex challenges of agriculture using data and AI sciences. And we started this journey 10 years back. Uh, and, and we saw, you know, as you rightly said, we need to double the food production by 2050. But if you do the maths, <coughs> it doesn't work, work out, right? So, so we have headwinds like climate change. We have, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, crop losses due to pest and disease. Uh, you know, uh, we are, we are dealing with low yield efficiency, uh, in the developing nations where 500 million farmers are producing food for, uh, those countries. So how do we, how do we, how do we connect with these farms and ensure that <clears throat> we tackle all these problems, which is not just, uh, you know, arising today, but also tomorrow. And, and looking at those problem statements, we, we said we need, a, we need to take a platform approach. We need to, uh, you know, uh, digitize this industry and then build a, you know, AI and science layer on top of it for the industry to take advantage of it. Today, we, we cater to around 52 countries. Uh, we work with around 7 million farmers. Uh, we manage 400 different crops in these countries and 10,000 different varieties of these crops. And we have, we have been able to, you know, help organization to improve, you know, we call it as, uh, you know, we make the farm more traceable, predictable and sustainable in that sense. And, and we try to improve the per acre value. For, for example, can, can we predict the, you know, disease in advance, looking at the, you know, uh, you know, field conditions, uh, uh, and then give a probability that in the next twenty days this is going to happen, and so that you can take a pre, uh, you know, uh, uh, precursor activities to solve for those. Can you predict the yield much before the harvest? Can you understand where are the risks within within your farm? If you have a one acre farm, we light up intelligence on every ten by ten meter of that farm, and say so which is under stress and what is the reason for that stress. And we're trying to solve these challenges, uh, not at the only plot level, but also at the regional, regional and the country level. So once, once, once we engage with the, our customers, we are helping, helping them and the growers to become more smarter in, in decision making. At the same time, using that crop knowledge graph, which we have built for 52 countries, we have you know, invested in AI, uh, and trying to build a general AI model. Which will scale and perform at the uh, consistent level, whether you are predicting predicting a country like India or Bangladesh or Nigeria or Latam. Right? And uh, we have been very uh, very successful in taking this model cross borders. So if one, once you learn from a fraction of data, let's say today we have got five zero point five percent of the global arable land data and the crop which is going on on top of it, and we have the knowledge graph of those. Now, basis that fraction of data, we are able to compute intelligence on 0.33 billion hectare. And today, we do global farming at uh, 1.5 billion hectare. So we we are already you know uh, ca capture the intelligence which covers around 103 million farmers on those lands which where they they are working. And by 2025, we will go up to five percent of those fraction of data, global arable land and the crop knowledge graph and that will give us a capability to compute every land on the planet and light up the intelligence and the risk so that we can manage it in advance so that's that that's how you know data and ai sciences uh, is will help industry to take a leap from thanks krishna that was yeah. very insightful uh, let's go with uh, rema so in addition to what krishna said um, ai also has a role to play in terms of directly increasing yields. So I'll give you some examples. One, for example, is the fact that you, we have to start increasing the yield of uh, per acre per hectare right? for multiple reasons. One, because of the fact that land is going to be in short supply. And as the population keeps increasing, the pressure on land is going to keep increasing for 
housing and other purposes. So obviously it will come down to the fact that um, how can you grow more crops from the same land. And um, this is where I think biotech is one area which is going to involve a lot of AI. <clears throat> biotech on its own will not be able to do it without uh, significant um, um, involvement of uh, AI in its algorithms. Like, imagine for the fact that how do you, um, for example, uh, pest control. So today, uh, pest, pest, uh, pest attacks is one of the major reasons for yields being low across the globe. And if you can use um, uh, visual technologies with AI, you can actually predict um, uh, pest attacks much earlier on and take corrective actions. Right? That's one area. Or for that matter, for example, using AI to be able to predict the pest attack much earlier than it attacks. And I'm sure that Krishna would be able to talk about that as well. For example, with weather patterns, if there's a wind direction that is there, you can always predict that there could be a certain kind of pest attack that will come in. So those are things that can happen with the data that has existed, um, uh, that we have gathered over a large period of, uh, you know, over decades of uh, data gathering along with computational technologies to determine patterns. Right? And so this is, this is going to be useful in terms of from, from things like you know, pest attacks, which is clearly uh, uh, a major issue. That is it. Going on to other areas as well where biotech can play a role <clears throat> is, for example, um, and gene engineered uh, um, crops. And I'm not talking of genetically modified crops, which you know has both for and against. I'm talking of just ensuring that the crops are having, having those characteristics, which will improve yields. Now that needs a large amount of, uh, of computational technologies that would need to go in there in order for quicker development of all these crop cells. Um, or for that matter to say is the fact that you need crop resistant, uh, pest resistant uh, crops at scale. And these are all, uh, this is where I think that uh, India has a significant role to play. If world over biotech is an area and computational technologies is a major area that's happening. And in India, we are seeing the early stages of this. I think that we, uh, you know, we, there's a huge potential because um, already computational technologies, IT's are strength. We are also building strength on biotech as well. Right? And so these two together, I think we have a huge opportunity going ahead. And that's, that's where um, we are putting our, uh, our money behind that. Thanks very much. <coughs> that was a good use cases that you kind of, kind of set the context and the stage for the rest of our conversation. Uh, now let's go with uh, Sunil. Sunil, please uh, share your perspectives as well. Thanks, Srini. Uh, to carry on with what Krishna and Rima were saying, I am one of the end users of the, uh, the technology part of it. And I guess in the past 25 years when we've been seeing it, whether with the dairy, whether it is with uh, the hydrophonics or the back end of the dairy in terms of nutrient, we have seen consistent use of technology being coming into the system. If I look at the dairy side, it's not only in the growing side or the animal side in terms of you know, better from AI to genetics being improved to moving away from regular semen to embryos coming into play from uh, you know, mechanization of order happening and improvement of order through moving it to silage and silage onwards with better seed coming in. So what is happening is there's a lot of tech that is coming in and like Krishna would have experienced and Rima's experience also. It is the blend of the entrepreneur's ability to adapt to the tech is also as important. And it's going to become a larger, wider play. For example, for us in the dairy sector, it's not only the tech of uh, the growing part of the animal part, but also the tech of logistics that has come in to help us you know, move milk across per seamlessly. The, the tech in terms of the selling point of a lot of the entrepreneurs coming in now to get source milk from the village and sell it to the farmer direct, source milk from the farmer directly and to the consumer, also enabling on the marketing side of the thing, right? So they're linking the whole. So today the new age dairy companies are trying to give the customer a fee of saying they know where the milk is sourced from to get back right to the farmer and source and enable the platform as such. So I think going forward, there is going to be a lot more of opportunities coming on for the entrepreneurial committee to take 
from where we are to where we are going to be. Coming in, when I look at my little dabbling around the hydrophonics, so the few people who have invested there. Like Rima said, the science in terms of I can't call farming farming anymore because it's moving into the biotech realm, right? From you know, when you talk about the genetics of the seed or the way you're sourcing the seed, so that's an industry by itself. If you go into you know guys trying to do uh, you know uh, nutrient, which is becoming a management by itself, and if you compare where we are in terms of yield per acre to what the rest of the world is. I don't see it as a problem statement, but more as an opportunity that we have so much more to do and so much more to be delivered as we go forward. But we also have to be very aware that India is changing dramatically in terms of the cultural shift on the ground. Uh, farming, which was earlier considered to be highly labor intensive and you know land sealing, making the lands pl uh, plots come long or smaller, is now changing dramatically because that labor has become either too expensive or simply not available to do. And that is also going to help in terms of other areas of harvesting. So with that, I'll leave it to you, Srini, to take it forward. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks a lot. Uh, so what I'll do now is uh, I have some questions uh, that I wanted to ask each one of you before we open up uh, Q&A to the audience. Uh, so let me, let me go with my first question uh, to Krishna. So Krishna, um, congratulations on... Uh, being present in more than 50 countries and touching uh, 7 million farmers across the world. I mean, kudos to you and your team. And that's not an easy task. However, uh, just wondering, what is the biggest uh, common pain point for these customers uh, across? And what is uh, cropping doing to, I mean, trying to do to solve that? I mean, is there a difference in tech adoption in, in, uh, some developed countries versus uh, developing countries. Uh, so what are your recommendations for Indian customers to be on par with the developed countries? I mean, uh, if you can throw some light on that and also cover some of the challenges uh, that probably developing countries would face from your experience. Sure. So let me first tackle this question. How different is the farming ecosystem when you move from developing nation, a small holder market to a large holder market? You know, I, I've traveled almost uh, most of the de developed and developing nations. And I, 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 I personally felt that the problem statements remain the same. Even in the, even if I was in Mexico and I was uh, visiting a potato farm, which was 500 hectare. And he was grappling with the same challenges of the yield, pest and disease, and unpredictable nature of his, you know, the whole agriculture business. Right. And if you come to uh, you know small urban market like India, Southeast Asia, Africa, the prob you know problem statements are not different. Right. So, so the only change you will see the mechanization and this you know uh, you know use of IoT and the sensors, which you know uh, small urban market they don't find ROI investing those kind of sort of mechanization, and that's the only difference. But the pain points related to agriculture remains the same. That's what my, my personal experience has been. And that's how what we built in India. We have shipped to 52 countries, including you know Europe, well, the France, Italy, Germany, and all those countries where the you know people are using our application to Latin to US to Africa, Southeast Asia. So you can see the demographic change uh, and the sm small holder to the large holder. Because the problems which we are talking about, how can you grow more with less? Uh, how can I improve my yield? How can I improve my quality? How can I bring predictability in my, uh, you know, uh, crop value chain? If I'm looking from the customer point of view or from the farmer point of view, how can I improve my per acre value? Now, the same problem statement changes when you go to a bank who is trying to underwrite a loan. He says, how do I understand the risk better of that particular farm? Because I'm going to give him a, uh, uh, you know, loan, but I don't understand agriculture. I, I don't have a visibility of what, what he has been doing with his asset or a land from the past three to four years. And 50,000 rupees or a, a lakh rupees is not viable for me as a bank to go on land, right? Because my cost operations are very high. So, so whoever is interacting with that one acre of land or a, uh, let me call it as an asset or a, a asset of the farmer. Uh, so there is a, there is a seed companies, input company, processors, a buyer, a bank and the uh, insurance companies or a farm equipment companies was, you know, so these all guys are trying to do some business, either they are producing alongside with the farmer to feed to the consumer, or they're trying to sell some products or provide advice. Uh, when we started 10 years back, 
there were too many challenges the infrastructure was not ready 2g network was not there smartphones were not there uh, and uh, uh, and the questions were like this right will my will my farm managers who have never gone beyond xsc will adopt it a mobile phone which is a smartphone which they have never seen they don't have a regular phone also will they able to do that work uh, will they understand the signs and the you know action on that phone or apps third was how much gb it will consume and fourth they have to buy a phone asset and then they have to take a network which will put a 1 gb so we have to recommend that at least it should have 1 gb ram 1 gb data and those were the you know trivial question we have to go through when the company has to buy the phone to distribute to the farm managers who will intend go and work with the farmer now i've seen those series uh, in a in a decade so now the smartphone so the farm managers already have a smartphone they already have a 4g network there's no question how much gb is going to consume it's just about download the apps and start working and it has become the dna of the industry now from the customer point of view if i'm working with the food and agri companies they are looking at uh, you know improving the quality and the productivity of the farm for their consumers so whether it's um, amazon or unilever or or let's say flamingo or or in, you know all these guys are they want traci- traceability they want predictability of their crop value chain they want to they are also working on the sustainability part of it the carbon and how can i use my resources uh, how, how can we use the resources available at the farm uh to grow more with less right so these are some of the question they dapple with and they want to control the quality at the farm for example if i am i i if i want my farmer to grow a particular watermelon for bangalore i will i will give him, i i want to handhold him to produce a variety which will be a half a kg size it will not like when you go to the second tier it will be 5 kg because the you know the family structure is very small in bangalore and they want to cut and they want to consume then you need a different variety so there is a partnership they are doing with the farmer right if 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 the cane or pexico is making you know fries or chips they want to cont- you know contain the sugar content of the potato at the farm level with the right practices and they have to again partner and train the farmer to do that and it's in their interest to increase the increase the productivity and yield because that brings our back operation up but at the same time farmer is getting know how and the more income because he is able to produce more uh, they are engaging with helping them to adopt scientific uh, advisory which we you know they can figure out our platform at the same time we learn from their data and we are making them you know the question the, 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 you know the question like if there is a tomorrow if we detect there is a frost attack at 4 in the morning what should be farmer doing in the evening last evening right so you should sprinkle water on his farm to take down the stress excellent this Krishna, is a- save your thoughts on that because i have a follow up question uh, you know yeah. which would probably you know make you talk more about that yeah. uh, regarding technical adoption and all the examples that you gave uh let me quickly go to reema uh for for now uh and then i'll, I'll come back to you uh so reema uh from a, from an investment uh, perspective i mean one i would like to hear from you uh for the for the benefit of the audience here what does the investment landscape uh, look for agri tech startups and is it any different compared to any other tech related uh, startups that uh, you would you would probably invested in, in the past um so basically things have changed in the last few years right? so so the um, agri tech is now mainstream so when we started we were among the very few who would do agri tech but uh, today you would see is the fact that it's mainstream there are uh, enough and more investors who are uh, looking at it and so tech i don't think agri tech uh, per se um is uh, um is lagging behind in terms from a capital perspective uh, last year itself there was close to about 500 odd million dollars had come into this sector um that's at a broad level but if you were to now break that down into into areas where i think that the opportunity is now coming up and hence i think capital flow will also happen is one is in um, ai technologies for various applications like the way in which krishna does or it could be in terms of say uh, quality grading 
um, or in terms of using AI for use cases that would be from a supply chain perspective. And those are just started to trickle in now. And you know, we see that that interest is going up uh, as well. So I think that would also change. Uh, the biotech part of it, AI and biotech, that part of it is still, um, it's not so much as Indian investors, but actually international investors who are more keen on that part as of now. Uh, Indian investors have so far uh, not done too many biotech deals and deep tech in the area of uh, these areas. So that is how I would break it up. But as I said that, you know, overall the agri space itself, agri tech space itself, has been in the interest uh, of, uh, has been uh, in the investors uh, have been looking at it for the last couple of years. I think the other two will also now start getting in, especially when they see that these organizations are scaling up globally and you have uh, international investors coming in, things should change. Thank you, Rima. Actually, that uh, triggers a point in my mind. So given your uh, investment thesis, where do you see Ankur Capital focusing in the next 18 months from an from a agri-tech and an Indian uh, perspective? So we're looking at a lot, which is the in cutting edge technologies, in the cutting edge technology space, which is biotech plus, um, uh, plus AI, or it could be purely being AI for, for uh, supply chain use cases. We are heavily betting on both these areas. We have some very interesting biotech cases that we are evaluating at this point of time. Uh, so that's that's where, or for example, there could be AI that is being used to do uh, uh, parametric insurance, for example. That's an upcoming area. Um, there are things that are coming up which would uh, indirectly help in increasing the yield per farm. I mean, it could be, for example, uh, uh, water usage could be one major area and to, to look at that patterns and all that. So those are all uh, interesting areas that we're looking at where these technologies are not applicable just for India, but also globally. So, um, you know, Krishna would know as a fact, we are among the first, we are the first institutional investor in, in crop and payback as well. Right? So uh, we've always been looking at uh, frontier technologies and seeing how these would change over the next five to seven years. So we're looking at any of those technologies which has the ability to scale in the next five to six years and become global players. Today, Krishna is against, you know, it's like across 50 countries, 50 plus countries. I don't think um, you know, anybody would have said that 10 years back, this, was, this is where Indian agri-tech would go to. Excellent. I think those are the parallel ones that we're looking at that could possibly scale in the next 10 years. And we become the same way as Boston is known for biotech. I think we should we should look at being, becoming one of that. That's where we are betting. Fantastic. Fantastic. Prima, uh, are you comfortable sharing how many agri-tech companies uh, have you invested in so far? Um, so agri across agri tech and food, and which includes the biotech space as well. Uh, Fourteen companies. Fourteen, and I'm assuming most of them happened in the last twelve months. Oh uh, no, it's been over the last three years. In the last twelve, months, we have is uh, last twelve months is four four companies that we have done four and we're looking to do three as we speak very nice very nice thanks Rima that, that was very useful very encouraging okay now I'll go to Sunil Sunil uh, again uh, you are one of the pioneers in Hyderabad I mean if not India as it relates to the dairy industry you've been uh, in the business for more than 25 years now so if you can uh, shed some light on uh, how did the technology play a role in scaling your business from brick and mortar kind of uh, you know setup all the way you have taken it ipo now so if you if you can uh, share some views and some challenges in the process and how you actually you know fix those and and 
been successful going public. So I think I'll mute. Uh, thanks, Rudy. I'll take. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't call it, you know, just the beginning of a journey where we are now. But like what Rima was saying, I think in part of the journey was getting the right people together first was the most important thing or the tech part of it as a human resource tech board, I would call it. It was right from the investors that we had who came in way back in 98 when we started. We were a VC uh, had funded in us called APIDC Venture Capital so along the way. And then came the tech part of it because once you get a broader board of people who can talk to you about what next and not worry about too much of the day-to-day -day activity where it comes in. But tech has moved tremendously on all fronts, which help us grow and start growing into a number of places or multiplication of operations. We, uh, dairy industry is invariably a multitude of small operations. For example, if I'm uh, procuring a lack liters of milk, I have around 1,100 uh, chilling centers each, which is an operation by itself, which is associated with, let's say, 7,000 villages and then backward into more, let's say, a lack or lack and a half farmers who are there at the back end of it giving milk. The earlier days when tech was not available, we were just you know, doing it manual and therefore it would become very restrictive for our growth. Now, right from uh, the tech of you know, banking improving, where today you're able to pay money directly into the farmer's account, to measuring quantity quality at the village level and giving it to the farmer instantly via you know, his, whatever app he's created or whatever he's using, to building it up in the back end of you know, the, the overall systems of trying to see mass balancing so that you know, you're not losing anything anywhere. Coming to the testing part of the milk quality, which has become so well automated that today you have a machine which can do 26 to 28 parameters of milk uh, variables, and which again helps you to go back to the testing of the product. And coming in, looking at the plants, which were earlier manual, where people used to open a valve or cleaning or whatever, which has now become PLC controlled and automated, and taking it forward into the markets. Now, coming to the farming itself, like Rima was saying, biotech, when I need to improve yields, there are a multitude of things that have to come into play. Right? For an animal, for example, it is insemination, which is breeding. Well, how do you breed? What animal do you look at? And it's a long-term view you have to take. You know, is it going to be a high productive animal or do you want to look at it as a, you know, a desi cow, which we call, which is more from a marketing point of view, as you keep listening to the later things of A2 coming into play, or when you look at now the vegan milk that is coming into play, so these things keep coming and going, but tech plays a major role. If you're not abreast of it, it doesn't let you grow. So when I come and talk about Dodla and where it has helped in scaling up and growing, it's as you adapt tech when you as and when you need it. It makes things more simpler and gives you the cookie cutter ability to expand. Like Krishna was talking about going to 50 countries. And now tomorrow Krishna is able to help the dairy industry in terms of saying the fodder problem can be solved in terms of what crop to be used, how does it get bailed, what is the process to be done, and the farmer gets uh, the use of it. Now, on the surface of it, it looks very simple, right? It's simply grass that you're cutting to give it to an animal. But the science behind it, the tech behind it, from biotech to crop management to the final delivery is extensive. So I think you know, farming and ag has been looked upon as though it is a low end, but I would like to call it as one of the more high end applications of technology. The more you're able to adapt and apply to it, it grows. You know, for the example, your background screen which shows the drone. I mean, it can be a major help to everybody, farmers, right, from the spraying to crop management, right? So I think the older companies from brick and mortar tech, we adapted, it helped us grow forward. But the more we can adapt now, you know, if I go look at it, why do I need to go to 7,000 villages to procure X amount of milk, which maybe it can be done even with 700 villages. Not saying I want to bring down the villages, but to improve you know, qualitatively. Why can't India be the largest global player in milk production, right? For example, we have the largest... Uh, animal population, we are the world's biggest producer, but we are also world's biggest consumer. But when you look at it from a global scale, we don't play a significant role because our efficiencies are per acre, which everybody has been saying now, remind so Now I think India is going to go through the phase of you no know, per acre improvement and then growing forward and bringing it to companies when you're scaling up. I think when I started 95 or so, capital was a constraint. Where you no, know, it was people who were, earlier was licensing, licensing then came to capital, people who had the ability to get half capital could go into business. But I think licensing is no more there. Capital with you no know, people like Rima there to help along the entrepreneurs to get the capital if they have the right view and the taking forward capital is available. I think now it is only time for you know, adaptation, people really working at it. And I look at people like Krishna, I really appreciate the size and scale they think of being global in nature and going forward. I think we were of the old school which had those chances of delicensing, lack of capital, which also helped us along the way. But as we go forward, those are not going to work. 
I think it is going to be who's got a better advantage, which works, and they have to be more aware of it and do things that way. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, Sunil. Uh, just uh, I was doing some research uh, on uh, some of the things that you have done. I I gathered that uh, during your uh, dairy, you know, journey, you identified two areas, uh, and and uh, you thought those are very very critical. uh might be useful for the aspiring entrepreneurs who are trying to get into dairy business uh, i believe uh, correct me you know i think it's something to do with breeding and feeding yeah so the what like rima was saying of biotech when i look at the animal breeding point of view if you look at the poultry industry india has gone leaps and bounds in being on par with the global poultry industry we are but the birds that are there in the industry who owns the uh, ip for the bird technology If I come to India, we had cattle which were of different breeds. The Indian breeds are now doing extremely well. If you take it and go and say Brazil, for example, right? the Girlandos, the Indian Gir that they bred with the Orlando there and created a breed which they needed the best. Now, when we come to India, giving our own peculiar problems. If I need to go to intensive farming, I have issues in terms of what do I do with the non-productive animal? What do I do with the male animal? Because in the system, we cannot produce these animals for a better usage or whatever, like the West does it, right? So we have a problem. That's right. Sorry to interrupt, but I think this is one area on a lighter note that the sex selection is actually working in favor of females. I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, because also as you remember, as the system changed, right? Earlier days, the bull was the tractor, and the cow was the one feeding, and they were also giving you manure. As science moved forward, the tractor, the bull was no longer required as a tractor, and we had to move to power equipment. And what do you do? Then sex sorting came in, and then the animals have come in. So, so much of things has been happening. Now today, can we build a breed from India? Why is it that we talk of the Holstein Friesian of the Jersey and India, which has been in the dairy sector for years, not have the ability to say we have our own breed which is specifically suitable to us, right? From a consumption point of view. So putting that science, but the challenge with the breeding in this today, I can talk about it because I've made my I've made some money and I'm okay. Now I can go back and do the money. And people like Rima to have the patience to you know wait and look at something for five years or six years to. Now make it go or Krishna trying to help that happen. For example, that is the breeding part of it, right? So to pick, select, move, and say if I want to buy an animal, India for all its enablement. Now we are getting a few platforms which are enabling farmers to buy and sell the animals. But I do not have a I have a few. I do not have a large amount of breeding centers. The average buying is still done at a village shanty. It's not moved into a thing where I have a availability of a breed. But if I want to buy a dog today, I can buy a dog for a very expensive price from a pet store, which is giving me three generations of pedigree of the animal. Where did it come from? How do I go for? Coming to the nutrient side, it's very funny that sometimes I find it you know, very difficult to digest. That I find protein sometimes being cheaper than digestible fiber getting in India for the farmer. Fiber is becoming more expensive because now India with the larger land mass, land mass, we are competing with human consumption and Animal requirement for the animal. So institutes like Itrisat have always been trying to say that no, we can do something which blends both, which is you know the, the crop that comes in gives the grain and the forage should be useful. Or the debate between should I get more intensive forage like a hydroponic putting wheat and barley and making hydroponic uh, uh, forage for the water for the animal. So there are wide spread of things that come right. But the problem statement like Krishna was saying is what problem statement to pick. How do you go about it? In part of the overall scenario, I am looking at it that I see a lot of tech coming in, but when it comes to the adaptation to the field, is where the challenges come. Which I bring it back to what Krishna was saying to teach a guy to use an iPhone might sound very simple, but to actually the initial days to go there to tell them what this is, to make use of it, and then to get the belief in what you are doing, I think is going to be the challenge. Tech will be there. There is plenty of tech that is already there, but to utilize it even in a simple thing like forage or fodder is complicated. I, for example, we grow maize, and we use a harvester to harvest, bale it, and we want to deliver it to the farmer just to pick the size of the bale. Because if it is a smaller farmer, it's a smaller bale of 30 kilos, more expensive. Or the larger farmer of three-ton bale, which is more cheaper because of size. So, but the opportunities are enormous. A, but only thing is patience, and then the entrepreneur should be uh, you know, uh, working hard in terms of addressing the statement and going forward. Pure tech <laughs> is not the only thing. Thank you. I mean, that actually reminds me uh, that I have to go back to Krishna on a follow-up question. So, Krishna, uh, I've been uh, speaking to some aspiring entrepreneurs in in agri tech, and uh, one of the concerns that they have, maybe I thought you can you can uh, you know uh, convey 
your your views on what what their concerns are and how they can fix them the concern being uh, see technology penetration in general right takes a uh, takes a lot of time before you actually see the fruit so so in convincing your customers i'm sure you might have encountered this uh, you know issue as well so how do you how do you go about you know making sure that uh, they have the patience they have the funds and you know the adaptation happens seamlessly do you have a magic wand you know that you would use to 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 sell your product and services i mean can you can you talk about it no i i, I don't think that tech journey is going to be any different than the e-commerce journey or any other uh, startup because you have to balance it out i mean you need to have a capital you need to have a customer you need to have a paying customer uh, so we are not talking about here you know building some biotechnology uh, product uh, the research is required there is r and d phase and then there is a take off happens and investor may be willing to wait for 3 3 years uh, uh, to give you that research period right and then uh, you build your uh, uh, business uh, business based uh, basis that i think there is no magic wand you have to you you have to work on the uh, you know value proposition of your product why you are building it who is going to you know take out the penny and pay, pay you for that particular product that's called your product market fit and you have to have as much as possible uh and we you know we also we also chose our market when we went b2b right so we go we work with farmers and the center is a farmer and all the impact is happening there but we we always we always went we said there are so so many you know intermediaries were working with the farmers we are going to enable them and they will take the technology to them right so we found out you know who is going to pay for the services but pharma in our in our sector pharma doesn't see value of advice or value of prediction or value of you know he says will i make more money this season is my crop uh, i i don't i'm doing the sowing today but i don't know what will happen in next four for months or six months is very unpredictable and his his income is not uh, certain like ours right so we have a salary which will come every month so he doesn't pay for solution and pns you, you you show him the value i mean farmer has been paying uh, and made many uh, mncs multi billion dollar company you, you sell seeds you sell uh, farm equipment they can see touch and they can pay for for that product but technology is still you have to find a different means and ways where you can monetize uh, by building on top of it uh, some services which uh, other can consume and you know uh, and pay for for those and it for different in our entrepreneurs it could be different right so depending on depending on what you are selling whom you are selling uh, and you have to build your uh, you know monetization model and there is no escape to it right so there is no leeway to a uh, ad tech startup in the thanks, world thanks of thanks krishna Yeah, so that actually um, makes me ask a question to Rima now. So Rima, I, I actually wanted to know. Uh, I'm no expert on this, uh, so is is it a myth that uh, people think uh, the the ROI uh, takes longer in agri tech or agri businesses uh, for you to return the money to your LPs, or or uh, or they're right about it? I mean, uh, can you can you share your comments on that, Rima? i don't think so so um so two things are there one is that um, the you know so well, let me take a step back and then um what i mentioned in my when i was when i was saying a few minutes earlier that uh, the the indian agro agri tech space itself has uh, first of all investor interest within india itself and secondly is the fact international investors are also aggressively looking at india okay. so uh, and then now to answer your question is the fact that the roi both in terms of the absolute returns and the time frame it takes to return that is based on two or three parameters so one is the entrepreneurs ability to scale quickly and you know how well they are doing the second is the investor interest to put in follow on capital and so when the further capital raises that come that you will be able to exit out and the third is the mnda opportunities that will come now if you look at overall in the indian investment space 
all these three you know the, the maturity that has happened in the last 2 3 years has been very very significant as compared to the earlier years in all the three buckets that i said is it right so from that perspective if you take agri tech also in that same list i think that india is today now poised to poised to give to perform as well as in fact more um you know we have our bets are on folks like propen and string bio and a couple of others who are all look, you know would be giving us returns which would be surpass definitely match but will actually surpass a lot of what the other uh, 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 other investments in other areas so i think is the fact that uh, today that is already happening the in, the companies are scaling up quicker they're looking at global markets cropen is looking for is at cross country markets uh, another of our company string bio is now actively talking to put up plans globally across three geographies as jvs um there is so so obviously it's it's increasing at a faster pace investor interest in india we already know but there's also international investors who are willing to put in money into indian biotech sector because they see this is a global market and the third in md as well while earlier the the industry used to be very conservative today we actually because we also run we seeded a a um a pl- an agri tech platform called as think ag which is to bring all innovators uh, um uh, industry and policy makers together in a platform and uh, the investors uh, the industry in that platform is actively looking to a uh, partner with innovators right and so that's the seeding so to say that you're going to have a lot more opportunities come up from mnd because they realize that unless they change like what sunil was mentioning in the dairy industry as well right i mean so, so all the industries are going through that change so what you are going to see is the fact that this this is a golden opportunity this is the golden hour when we should have investors should be actively looking at the spaces because over the next 5 6 years you will you're going to see that real boom and uh, uh, i don't think that this is in any way going to lag i think that old chola wala of one kisan somewhere standing you know trying to make his ends meet versus the agri tech itself are two different uh, things we should look at these in different yeah. perspectives that's that's pretty encouraging for uh, entrepreneurs uh, architect space i mean uh, they could expect uh, funding happening uh, and it's only growing and probably at its infancy right now so thanks for your views on that so one question uh, again uh, related to that is uh, if you have to pick the top 3 things what you look for in a in a potential portfolio company i mean primarily i'm talking about agri tech if there's a difference between how you pick your uh, you know bets can you share some thoughts on uh, what is what is that you know one two or three things that you look for in in uh, investing any any compelling agri tech startup i mean for the benefit of the audience can you uh, so it's not different from any other investment per se um so the the fact that this has to be cutting edge and for the global market only indian market solutions would not work so, so obviously looking for things that would work globally the second part of it is the fact that it is cutting edge there is ip involved and that you can actually go look global right i mean so that's a very very important thing that you're looking at stuff that is cutting edge as well uh and that the person work people working on that are all domain expert there is a domain expertise of some because this is not something where you can do it in the lab without having a knowledge of what happens in the ground both in terms of the the use case as well as the 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 um, um the deployment but the execution part as well like you know like what sunil mentioned that it's you need to work with what the consumer wants and how are you going to get the consumer to adopt it as well so that domain expertise is very important absolutely and of course it goes without saying that the entrepreneur has to be ambitious um and um, is it, it, everything depends on the entrepreneur excellent so we, we we're looking for more krishna kumar sense yeah so okay uh next question uh i would have it for sunil sunil uh, i know you're you're exploring this uh, hydroponic uh, farming 
right now. So if you can share some of the thoughts on uh, hydroponic farming for, for aspiring entrepreneurs, you, do you see that uh, hydroponics being the future of growing vegetables and fruit for various reasons, uh, you know, maybe because of efficient use of land resources and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, if you can, if you can uh, give me a quick one or two minute, uh, you know, insightful perspective on that. So hydroponics with what little I have seen is basically I have been associated with the, the person called Sachin who was doing a Nike guy who came back and started hydroponics. He started with a smaller 5 acre, 10 acre kind of hydroponic, hydroponic growing facility and then joined up with a, a fund which invested with him and set up a large facility on 140 acres with 35-40 you know, acres of covered growing. So hydroponics is basically taking the agri-tech part of it to be more predictable in nature, especially when you started looking at it as saying as fruits or vegetables or whatever. People have a choice. You can grow right from nutraceutical requirements from you know, turmeric, which can give a higher, you know, let's say, curriculum content to growing the lettuce, to growing our own methi, to whatever we need. But I think it depends on where you're looking at from the market. If you look at the more developed names, nations like Amsterdam, where the tomato, cucumbers or flowers or whatever the world they're growing, people have become specialists. They're creating a brand. I think when I look at it from hydroponics, I look at, I think if you look at from branding point of view, the kitchen has now also become very well branded in India. Earlier, you didn't have branded uh, rice, you didn't have branded salt, you didn't have branded uh, uh, pulses, which is all getting branded. I think the fresh area is the area where there is the least amount of brand. You know, like all of us, like consumers, when you buy a mango, when you buy a fruit, you don't want to eat it immediately, right? You want to wash it, you're not worried about it. Whereas the same thing, you pick up something abroad, you're more comfortable in eating a tomato out of a box, maybe a cherry tomato popping. So I think we will go through change as the GDPs are increasing and people are getting more affordability. People will want all that. And hydrophonics is one of the easier way to give it. But from what little I've seen, I think focus on particular product or at least a product category, right? It can be broadly broken into, let's say, leafy, wine crop, long-term crops. People should look at the market, come to pick and choose what they are comfortable with and take that product up. It's a lot of science involved. And for heaven's sake, people think farming of hydrophonics is not, all of them come up with the hobby point of view. And once they have to get up every day and walk, walk the farm, look at it, look at the tech and look at all this, then they get very worried about it. So it is a lot of effort that you require. So farming, even tech, or the, hydro, the hydrophonic farming, although it looks of high technology, it's a blend of both. You have the physical activity of walking in the farm, right? If it's five acres also, even if it's small, you physically have to go to understand what it is, see the new, what happens. Krishna's tech can give you a spew a, a report for you, but if you don't understand how to utilize the report, then don't go there. Potential is huge. It can have uh, Everybody requires good quality food. It will bring down the price, but the real interest of working hard at it, having the ambition to build it is where the key is. Thanks, Anil. Thank you. I think uh, we are we are uh, getting almost to our uh, you know 11 a.m. time deadline, I guess. Uh, so let's take a couple of questions from the audience now. Uh, there's one question uh, from one of our uh, charter members from Hyderabad. Uh, his question is to Sunil: What uh, drives you, and where you see the dairy business five years from now? Quick uh, one minute answer, Sunil. So the dairy business, okay, being a listed company, I'm not supposed to give too much of futuristic statements as a, I can, I'll try to be as, you know, sticking to the things as possible. See, any business, I think now we have come to a size and scale, basic consolidation happening. And it's only the consistent growth that comes because of people, process and systems that we have improved. Dairy consumption in India will change forms, which will continue to grow. Consumption is growing and it's growing because, not because of the top end of the 100 million, right? The 100 million demographic of India is driving the high end of sales. But the rest of the demographic of India is growing. So it's not only dairy, but food itself is going to go through a sustainable change. And if I can take two more seconds of it, when we started, people used to buy milk and make curd at home. In the last five years, people are buying curd. They're not making it at home. And I'm not talking about the A-grade store buying a cup of curd, but a 10 rupee sachet. So that kind of change, it might not be looking as a great change, but now everybody can afford to buy curd and they're buying. So that will make the change happen. And the changes are going to continue. And who can adapt will do better. Thanks, Sunil. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, we have three more minutes. So before we wrap up the session, um, I think uh, if you want to give one tip, each one of you to the entrepreneur audience, uh, uh, what would that be? You know, 10 seconds tip, please. So Sunil, we can go first since you're talking. 
So thanks. So, uh, my thing is simple. If you really believe in what you are doing and you are going ahead and doing it, do it. But be sensible enough to take uh, proper advice, right? So uh, more, no, normally entrepreneurs we get to get carried away with what we think as our idea is the most brilliant and not able to listen to others even if it is right or wrong. But have the blend of both your dedication, your commitment. But if you are on the wrong path and if you think somebody is giving you advice, not to be too hard-headed, but be able to accept that and change the path and go along. Thank you, Krishna. Thirty-second answer, please. Yeah, so I'll keep it one word. You know, perseverance. I think that is and um, resilience is important. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and that speaks a lot. Yeah, Rema. I would say it's a fact. Uh, you should be ambitious globally. Look global market. Be look at IP led um, uh, developments, which is global in nature, and make it techno commercial. Just not technical, but techno commercial should be the focus. But be ambitious and look at the global market. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so Thank you. yeah. So just uh, quickly summarize uh, some of the takeaways from our conversation uh, again uh, for the benefit of the participants here. Uh, so the future of agri tech startup looks very promising. We learned some uh, AI techniques that's going to help enhance uh, agri efficiencies. You know, increase yields, productivity, and obviously, you know, the bottom line, which is uh, profitability as well. Uh, we understood there are some key opportunities uh, out there, and uh, we talked about how to go about raising funds and what the investment landscape looks like. And uh, last but not least, uh, AI is going to be a game changer and could revolutionize the agri industry. With that, thanks for your participation. I thank all the speakers for making the session very lively and engaging. Have a good day. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.